Welcome everybody, and thanks so much for joining Southern Maryland Audubon for our presentation uh, behind the scenes in wildlife photography. I'm Molly Moore. I'm the president of Southern Maryland Audubon. So we record all of our Zoom uh, programs and have an archive on a range of, of uh, wildlife and bird issues and gardening subjects available free for viewing on our website. Uh, it's at southernmarylandaudubon.org and on our YouTube channel. So also, just to note, many of these lectures count as continuing education hours if you're a master gardener or you are a master naturalist. So our guest is Dean Newman, and I'm sure there's not a person on this call that wouldn't love to be able to take photos like Dean's. But Dean has been a passion has been passionate about birds his entire life. Um, he joined the Navy in 1975 and graduated from the Naval School of Photography. He worked many years as a, a photojournalist and a camera repairman. But after receiving his commission, serious photography was replaced by a wife and kids and a career. So now retired, Dean is spending his life like many of us would love to. He spends his time traveling throughout North and South America photographing birds and other wild creatures. He lives in St. Mary's County in Southern Maryland with his long suffering wife who nurses him back to health each time he returns from a photography adventure. We're very fortunate to have Dean on our Southern Maryland Board of Directors and to have him sharing this presentation. So Dean, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Molly. And tell you what, I thank you very much for the, for, for the nice intro on that. Again, I'm Dean Newman and uh, I've uh, entitled my talk tonight about mamas don't let your babies grow up to be nature photographers. If I had known then what I know now, I'd have probably played golf or something. But, you know, my tagline down there is I wish I had the life that everybody accuses me of having. But before I get into that, and I'll talk about that some, let me tell you a little bit about myself. Now, come, there we go. Now we got it. So again, I'm Dean Newman, and I am a professional nature photographer. Uh, I am published a lot in magazine, magazine covers. I've got book covers both nationally and across Europe here. Uh, my photographs are used there. Uh, Molly told me, I, yeah, I was a Navy photographer for eight years as, as an enlisted man. I got uh, and, uh, in the Navy and really, really enjoyed that job. I mean, I, was, uh, I love photojournalism. And I get myself in a lot of trouble, even with wildlife today, because if I'm behind a camera, I feel like I'm bulletproof. And um, uh, just last just last week, I was photographing bears down in down in uh, North Carolina, excuse me, in Tennessee. And and my wife was up there on the trail, screaming her head off that I was too close to the bear. But when I've got a camera in my hand. Uh, I photograph for fire departments and I go right in the fire with them with, with the cameras. And so I love photojournalism. It's just so much fun to do, but uh, it is a young man's game. So I left photojournalism. I got a, I gained a commission in the Navy and I spent the next 21 years riding aircraft carriers and, and, and having a great time doing that. So, but I picked up my first digital camera uh, a, a Canon EOS 20D uh, in 2004, and and the old 100 to 400 lens there, and my tagline on that, my wife has regretted that ever since uh, because Molly said it when I come, you know, I'm 68 years old. And, and, and I'm out there doing this young man game. And, you know, I don't get any, when I'm out there working, I don't get sleep, you know, and I'm out there in all kinds of weather. So I always come back sick. My wife has to nurse me back to health. She literally, literally every trip coming back, she's got a, she's all carrying a thermometer. She's got a first aid kit that she just puts me to bed and nurses me back. Uh, I live in California, Maryland. Uh, we moved here in 2001. This is where the Navy dropped me off at. I retired from the Navy in 2003, and then I retired from civil service where I was teaching graduate courses uh, for the government there. And just, that that's, then I, I would, I would, I would have done that job for free. I, I just love teaching. So I love doing what I'm doing now. So I'll just say this up front. 
if you guys need me to come give a talk some to, to some church group or some charity group or something like that, that hey, uh, get hold of me. I'm, I'm happy to do all of that. We'll work a schedule out to do it, and I'm happy to do that to anybody, okay? Um, I, again, I am married to a very understanding wife, Sandy. Uh, she says this is not much different than the Navy because I'm still gone all the time. I travel over, I travel well over 150 days a year. I don't know, maybe more than that. I travel a lot and uh, have such a good time. My wife has, does not enjoy leaving the concrete. Isn't it amazing how we marry people so different than us? But she she does not share my passion for 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 living in the jungle and 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 you know eating cans canned beans and you know getting up at all hours. That is not my wife. My wife is is a Fifth Avenue kind of girl, and so but but you know thank goodness and praise God that I've got a wife that doesn't that doesn't prohibit me from doing what I enjoy. And she, in fact, encourages me to do it. In fact, on many occasions, if, and if you've known me very long, you can probably relate to her. She, she even told me, she said, Dean, it's about time you go somewhere, if you know what I mean on that. So my wife's not. Uh, <laughs> We spend a, I spend a lot of money on camera gear, and I'm going to give you an endorsement, unequivocal endorsement to Alice's camera st uh, store in Levittown, PA. It's a little mom and pop place. I don't get a dime from them. This is not any kind of a, a promotion where I get paid to do it. I get nothing out of this except that they're just great people, and it's a little mom and pop store that uh, gives me a lot of service, and I, that's where I buy all my gear at, so I'm putting that on for you, okay? Now, as we start into this, first I want to talk about do you really, really, really want to do what I do? So I'm going to show that, and then we'll get into some of the rules about bird photography here. And then uh, I'm happy to answer questions about any of the stuff at any time here. If you've got photography-specific stuff about cameras and that kind of stuff, uh, I'm not sure. I, I I don't know. You know, I'm not going to. I don't know every camera that's made, so I probably can't tell you how to operate your manual, et cetera, but, but we can talk about stuff like that, uh, and, and we'll work on that. So when you're doing this, I find in this world there are two categories of people that, 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 that chase birds with a camera. First of all, there are birders who want to photograph, and, and you know they're out there. They're doing record shots. And they're using their photographs as an identification aid. You know, they don't know what the bird is, so they take a photograph of it, then come back when they can study it. And, and more power to you. If that's what you want to do, I mean, I am in no way am I am I looking down on you or, or, or judging you. That's just what you want to do and have at it. Now, that's not me. I'm part of this second thing. I'm a photographer that wants to bird here. See, what I'm going to do is what I try to do with my images. I try not only just, I don't, uh, not just to record the bird, but I want to record art. I want something that you want to hang in your living room. That's the stuff I want to make here. Uh, I want to tell a story about the bird. Uh, or I want to, I want to show people what one of the greatest thrills I have doing this is is showing people what is right in their own backyard. It, 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 Southern Maryland Audubon, if, if you're not out there telling your neighbors what's in the backyard, you're missing a great opportunity because 90% of the people who live in our county don't realize what our, how much wildlife we have here. So, you know, so that's what I'm out there to do. Uh, yes, I sell images, but to be honest, I give as many images away as I sell, to be honest with you. Uh, and, and any uh, charitable organization that needs my images for a fundraiser, if you have them, I'm all over it. Let me know. We'll work something out. I don't, I don't you know, and, and I'll, I, I'm not going, I'm, I personally, I'm not going to make a dime off of you for that. Uh, anybody, any charitable organization that needs my photographs, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll work something out there that, that you'll, you'll be glad you did on that. If you like the images on that. So that's the category of people that I want to talk to tonight is they're, they're, they're photographers that want to up their game in bird photography. Now, if you're part of that first category there, birders that want to photograph, hey, I'm glad to have you in this meeting and I'm going to entertain your questions. I'm not going to judge you, but I'm going to be honest with you. You're not going to get anything out of this. It's going to help you. This is not going to help you a bit if you're part of the first group, because that's not what I do. So enjoy that. Okay. Now. 
why do I do, why do you want to do this stuff? A few, uh, uh, just before the pandemic, you know, I, the, the, the magazines, uh, I, I worked for a cartel, I, I, I worked with a cartel and we bid on uh, the assignments here and, you know, it, it, magazines say the cheapest one they can get, you know, sends and I'm always cheap. So they send me, you know, there's a lot to say about me being cheap, doesn't it? But anyway, so we're down there and, and we're in, in Ecuador. And this is in the swamps down there, just off the, this is one of the, the uh, down there in the, in the very lowlands of Ecuador. And it is hot. I mean, it is hot as blue blazes down there. So we're out there and, and, uh, and if you go to South America, don't think you're going to go down there and see wildlife left and right walking through the jungle. Honest to goodness, you will not see anything. You won't see birds. You won't see anyone unless you've got one of these Indians, one of these native Indians down there to help you. It, th these guys are amazing to me. And, and my, I just have all kind of admiration for these guys. But anyway, so we've got our guide service here and we're in this boat and we're going down this creek here. And let me draw your attention to what might be in here. First off on the back here, and I'll blow this up for you. Notice here that that little bump back there is a South American alligator called a caiman. And, and, and the jungle is full of these things, everything. Now, what I can't show you in this photograph is under the water, this full of piranhas. Piranhas are a real thing down there, and they're there. So that's a couple of things I want you to keep in mind. The other thing is, is my guy's got a hole inside of his boat. He has dutifully patched it with duct tape. That's what it's on that side right there. Well, you've got two big guys here in the boat with those camera gears. That's 35, 40 pounds a piece, plus the guy here. The results are inevitable, aren't they? We wind up in the water. Thank goodness there was another boat there that took this picture that we could throw our camera gears to as we went down with a boat on that. So that's some of the things you get into when you're dealing with, with in, in these third world countries. And, and, and you take what you get here. Something else you're going to look at is, is the great living conditions we're in. This is the other side of the mosquito netting around my bunk. As we're, as we're in a, 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 this time we were in a hut. Now, it's not snakes that I worry about, but wasp. Everything in the jungle either bites you stings you or gives you a rash it is a horrible place to live and so this is the other side of my uh, uh, of the mosquito net. so oftentimes we're living either on huts or in jungles here and we're back so far in the jungle that we're bringing in diesel fuel and gasoline and you don't have enough diesel fuel and gasoline to run your generators 24 7 so you've got generator hours and most of them, that generator hours is not just for your comfort. It's to charge your camera batteries and get those squared away. So you hurriedly do that. And so when it's time to go to bed, I go there and I look around that, that uh, bed, that rack. And I mean, I look, got a flashlight and I'm looking everywhere to make sure nothing's in there. And then I get in there and I tuck that mosquito netting in so tight around that bed that not one breath of air can get through it to touch me all night long. And I lay there and sleep in sweat all night long down there because it's got awful hot down there. Are you sure you want to do this? Then there's the other side of the world. They send me, they, they, this is where I, they sent me up to the Pribilof Islands. If you know where that's at, it's two little specks of rocks. That's six hour plane ride west of, of Anchorage, out in the Bering Sea. Now, they, they sent me out there, and they dropped me off and left. Now, there's a fish processing place there, so I'm not exactly by myself, but for all the good it was, I was by myself. So I'm there photographing. I spent a week there photographing. They were supposed to come pick me up, and all of a sudden, this fog bank rolls in. They can't land the airplane to get me. And, and I spent another week there, socked in with fog, my whole life elsewhere. At this time, I was working and teaching. I had a graduate class going, and, and, and they just had to go on hold because I'm stuck up there in, in the Bering Sea. You know, I can't get home. So there's, there's that to deal with. 
So the other thing we're down there, we're up in the, this is, uh, this is, I'm up in the Andes here and I tagged this one here. I want you to look at this thing. This is the, 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 the photographic cool pro working this thing here. I'm at 14,000 feet. Folks, you can tell by this accent that I am not a mountain man. I grew up in the flatlands of South Alabama and North Florida. I mean, I, I get nosebleed being this tall folks, but we're up at 14,000 feet here and the air up there, we're right. And I'm, by the way, look how I'm dressed. We're right on the equator, but this cold up when you get that high. So I, this is the production shot, but let me show you behind the scenes here. So <laughs> minutes prior to the previous slide, I want you to look at this face. Look at this face. I am out of breath. We have run these seed snipe up and down these uh, up and down these mountains here, and I am out of breath. Finally, I can't go any further. There's a hero to this story, and and this is this guy right here. It's my bus driver. The bus driver. He's obviously acclimated to the place. I'm sitting there hasting breath. I can't go another step. He's got his camera in his left hand there. He grabs up my big rig there. You know, all 40 pounds of that puts it and yells at me, underlay, underlay, underlay. And I start staggering after him. So we finally get this seed snipe cornered up there where, where he's going to have to jump off and fly off a cliff here. The, Andre sets the, the, sets the uh, tripod down with the camera on. I stagger up there. The bird is perfectly centered in the viewfinder. I press the button. I don't have to do anything. And, and, and I get a magazine shot out of that. What a hero this guy is in. Incidentally, this is my 23-year-old snot-nosed boss. Now, I call him snot-nosed, but let me tell you, this, is, this guy is one of the best photographers I've ever known, and he's scary smart. Uh, I don't. I, I, I kind of talk to Spartan like this with him, but frankly, I have all kind of admiration for this young man. He's really a good guy there on that. Okay. Now, going back to my, my bus driver friend, he and I really connected after that, and, you know, I gave him – uh, he got a pretty good tip out of this with me. So, so he kind of bonded to me. So we're at another little spot there in Ecuador and I, and I'm in my hooch over there. It's at uh, about two o'clock in the morning. And he, and this guy comes beating on my door. Now he doesn't speak English and I don't speak Spanish. So he comes beating on my door and he kind of goes, hoo, 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 and tells me there's an owl out here. And he points at my camera and said, bring your camera, bring you get my camera. And so I run out there and I'm in my underwear. I've got flip-flops on and underwear, and we're running out through the jungle here. And he shines his light up in the tree, and there's this black and white barred owl sitting there. And 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 I get this photograph of it. Nobody else got it. But I took that literally, literally took this picture. I was uh, you know out there in the jungle in my underwear at night. <laughs> now, so but every once in a while they're good to me. I have no idea what this mystery meat is, stuff they feed us, okay? But they, you stop on the side of the road, and whatever they got there, you beat the flies off of it, they make you a sandwich, and you eat the stuff. <laughs> I've never been sick, but you can see that face there. That's a happy face because I'm not sweating. I'm not wet. I'm not out of breath. I'm just sitting there eating the, eating these potato chips and that whatever that meat is there, I never didn't know what it was and I'm afraid to ask. <clears throat> now, so there's some of the, the fringe benefits you have for having this job here. Excuse me just a minute. I'm about to cough my head off. <clears throat> then you get home and you find out your buddies have posted something on the internet and you didn't know it until you find it yourself here. So you find these things, they, 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 they kid pretty hard guys. So, and then, all right. <laughs> and the working conditions, this is a sharp tail grouse. We had a lek up in, uh, up in, uh, Northern uh, Minnesota. So we're down here and I want you to notice the camera angle. It's going to become important later, but for example, right here, look at the reading of my car thermometer. This is not wind chill. This is the thermometer of on my car. It is minus 30 degrees out there. I lost three toenails to frostbite in this shoot. Now, you can see here in the right-hand corner, that's myself and my buddy. We're laying on this snow 
photographing those sharp tail graphs to get that low angle on. Excuse me. Now, luckily, we were staying at this house with some people, and they had Great Danes. On the way out the door to this shoot, I kicked the Great Dane off of his dog bed, and I grabbed that dog bed and took it with me, and, and we carried it out on the snow and lay on that dog bed, keep having to lay in that minus 30. Look at the back of my camera down there, too, how, how much ice is on that. And let's talk about the pay that I get from this thing. Now, this is a obviously a, bel a female belted kim kingfisher. If you don't know that, uh, why you, I can tell it's female. Notice that the brown belt, only the, only the female has that brown belt. The male doesn't have it. Now, this is a very common bird here around Maryland. But if they're very, as you well know, they're very, very wary. They're very difficult to photograph because as soon as you get anywhere close to them, they just fly off because they just find more water to go to. Obviously, they're, they're a fish-eating bird. They're going to be around water. They're just going to fly more water. But this bird was down in Midland, Texas. And they needed somebody, they wanted to, they wanted to photograph, the, one of the magazines wanted to photograph Kingfisher. And so I bid the job. They sent me down to Midland, Texas. So I get down there to Midland, Texas, and this bird is hung out in a stock pond down there. And a stock pond probably, oh, at best, 100 feet across, if, if that. Now, if you know anything about that part of Texas, there's not a lot of water there. So this bird is going to stay pretty close to this pond. I know that. The first thing I do when I get into the pond, to get, get there, I start building the rig. And by the way, spoiler alert, when you're looking at any magazine of a nature picture, spoiler alert, every one of those pictures are staged. We are not, editors do not allow us to go out there and wait for something to show up or happen to find the right branch for him to sit on or put up with stuff in the background. No, you've got to establish a shot. Now, it is a wild bird, but this is what it looked like. This is, come here. This is what the shoot looks like right there. That bird is sitting on that limb right there. So the first thing I do when I drive up down there, I grab a metal fence post that's, side the, that's sitting there side the pond, and I wade out in this pond. It's about waist deep. And I drive this metal fence, uh, fence post down in the mud, and I get it steady down there. And, and I go out there, and I find this, this, this snag you see there. I, I, I find that. I even find some Spanish moss and dra drape on it to make it look pretty. And I got a whole pocket full of zip ties and I zip tie that snag to that metal post. Well, that Kingfisher is happy as a dead pig in the sunshine because instead of hanging out on the side of the pond, now he can get in the middle of the pond and have a 360 degree view of things to fish from. He's going to go there. No doubt about it. <laughs> it's also the highest thing around. He's going to be there. So, the next thing I do is I go down to Walmart and I buy this blue baby's wading pool right here. And then I go over to Bubba's bait shop and I find me some minnows. Now I don't want big old honking minnows, nor do I want bitty minnows. I want minnows that are the appropriate size to the bird. So Bubba and I get, he, he all of a sudden, you know, you, you, people are just all over this when you tell them what you're doing. You know, they, so Bubba and I are bent over in his minnow tank there and, and we're scooping out the right side of minnows. He even lets me use his minnow, uh, his, 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 his minnow cage there, that square thing you see there. He even lets me use that and it's deep. We can put minnows in that and they can go down deep where the fish can't get them. Now I zip tie that to the snag, but the, the wading pool, I zip tied the snag as well, but I only put a couple of inches of water in that wading pool. And so every morning I would take my net and I would put a couple of minnows over in that baby's wading pool. The, the kingfisher would hit that snag, jump down, get breakfast and be happy. Now, my problem was this. That bird was hitting that snack, that, that getting that snack, hitting that snag long before I had enough light to shoot with. It was just barely pink. So what I had to do was 
I had to uh, uh, stretch a piece of mosquito netting over. I put the minnows in that in that uh, wading pool. I put a piece of mosquito netting over that wading pool. I took a piece of monofilament line, and I went all the way back to the bank with it to my blind. And I got into my blind long before day. It was cold, hard, dark, and I waited. Well, as soon as the sky got sort of pink, that kingfisher hit that snag went down to get his breakfast. He couldn't because of that mosquito netting and get agitated. As soon as the sun crested that horizon, I pulled on that, I pulled on that uh, monofilament line, moved the mosquito netting, the kingfisher dropped down, got, got the, uh, sl- the, 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 the minna. I got that shot. You know how much money I got paid for that shot? $35. $35 for all that work. So you sure you want to do this kind of work here? The pay is great on that. Okay. But that's the kind of things we do in nature photography. All righty. Now, all right. Now let's talk about some things that'll make your bird photography better. If you're, uh, if you, uh, if you really want to do this and there are, you know, I can say I'm Southern. That's why I do it. I mean, but, but maybe you got to smart in that, but, but uh, it, some random thoughts just that I couldn't put anywhere else. I'm just going to stick them here. If you do bird photography for art's sake, you are going to suffer. You are going to suffer for your art. There's no doubt about it. I've been, I've been beat up by a Rhea in, in, uh, in the Pantanal. Thank goodness he didn't kill me. I've been chased by moose and Grand Tetons. Uh, we played Ring Around the Roses or for a rock for, I don't know, it seemed like forever, but he kept chasing me around a rock. I kept going around that rock. He couldn't get to me. I've been bitten. I have been excreted upon. Uh, and 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 that's what's good. You're going to suffer for this art. You're never going to get enough rest doing this thing. Item, random item number two. There's no such thing as too much lens for bird photography. If you're going to do bird photography, you're going to need a minimum of 500 millimeter lens. Okay, I'm 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 not going to back off that statement. You guys can tell me you're with, with your one to four hundred or your four hundred millimeter. Okay, great. But no editor is going to uh, is going to accept a file blown up that much without the, the feather detail in it. You're, it. So, so the point is, this is an expensive thing to do. It's expensive. Now, assuming that you're still with me, I'm going to let you in on the very best photography book that's ever been written. And, and, and I got a required legal statement there. In no way am I compensated for the following endorsement, nor do I benefit from your purchase of this book, but it's the very best photography book you'll ever buy. And it's your camera's owner's manual. If you're using your camera on automatic, and I even include aperture priority and shutter priority in that, you're never going to create art folks. You see, if you're letting that box make the decisions about your image, if you're making that box, letting that box make those decisions, This is not your game. That image that comes out of that camera should never be a surprise to you. You need to know before you push that button what that image is going to look like. And the only way you can do that is you need to understand that camera, understand its limitations and its capabilities. 95% of the people carrying these big D, these big cameras. I said, almost said uh, DLSRs, but now it's mirrorless. They're carrying, they're spending big money on these things and they're using them on P or something like that. So whatever the automatic function is. Now, you've just wasted an awful lot of money if you've done that. Use your iPhone, it's better. So no rocks if you want to on that statement, but I, I'll stand by that to the day I die on that. You're going to need, you, you need to know, you need to understand your camera if you're, if you're going to do that. And, and this is a, this is a, a, just about the time you get your camera down, they update it. 
and you got to get a new camera, not because you want to stay up with technology, but because the new cameras are so much better. Their capabilities are so much better than what you can do with your old camera. It's amazing right now, the revolution in, 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 in photography going on with mirrorless stuff. Uh, I am a, I have just bought my first mirrorless Nikon Z9. And I am absolutely amazed at the capability of that camera. I, I, I just am blown away by what it can do. So know that. All right. With that said, here are, I think, seven things you got to do to make great bird photographs. Now, as I was previewing this moments before Molly brought me into the meeting, I realized that I got two number sixes. So I'm going to tell you that. And I, I didn't take time to edit it. I'm just going to beg on you, beg for your indulgence here. There are seven of these things that I think you got to know. And, and you may point out an eighth one or a ninth one. And I'm okay with that too. Let's, let's talk about it. I'm all for that. The number one thing you got to know to be a bird photographer is you got to know your subject. You've got to know, excuse me, come back here. You've got to know its range, its habits, its calls, its behavior. And this shot right here is a, is a great example. I, I took this shot right over here, you know, five miles from my house in Greenwell State Park. It's an eastern screech owl. And, 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 and if you know anything, if you know, they've got both the, the brown and the gray, they can be in the same litter. There's two color phases for it. They'll be in the same litter. This is the gray one. The predominant color phase, by the way, in Southern Maryland, it seems to be the red. Uh, that's an anecdotal thing to me, but uh, I, I very seldom see a gray one. But because I know about my subject, I'm walking there with, I got my camera and that big 600 millimeter lens. And I see the hole in the tree. The owl is not visible. He's down in that tree. But I said, that is a great place for a screech owl to be. The problem is this, is that I, it, that, that photographing the, an owl like this is a two-person endeavor. You see, one guy's got to step by there and operate the camera, but somebody else has to go up there and rub the tree. If you rub the tree, the owls have that super sensitive hearing, and they think a predator is climbing up there, and they'll pop up to see what's there. Now, if you slap the tree, most of the time they'll just fly out, and you don't get them. But rub that tree, and they'll come up. So I'm sitting there and I said, that's a great place to be. And as luck would have it, down the trail come this teenage boy, probably about 17 years old. And I said, dude, I need your help. He says that big camera, man, he's all over helping me. He said, what do you want me to do? I said, I want you to go over there and rub that tree. The look. The look that guy gave me was, was absolutely classic. I mean, <laughs> I finally convinced him to go rub that tree, but, but when he was going to that tree, he never turned his back to me. He, he kept, he backed up to that tree watching me the whole time. <clears throat> of course he rubbed the tree. As soon as he rubbed the tree, there was a screech owl in there. It popped up. I got this shot. I showed him it was all, all right, but you have to know your subject and know the, what they're going to do and where they're going to be at for that thing for, to find that. Another great example of these Harris hawks here. <clears throat> now the large hawk in the background is a hen, and this is a juvenile that's with her here. Now I knew that this hawk would have a hard time out there in, uh, where was I at? In South Texas somewhere photograph. I knew I have a hard time finding stuff. So I knew that I could bait this hawk. So what I do is I found this great looking stump here. I set a blind up and I put chicken gizzards back there. Well, they found these chicken gizzards in just a matter of a couple of days. It wasn't anything. They found them. And you can still see a little chicken gizzard on the beak of that juvenile there. If you look close enough there, but they come in there and they come in to photograph. So I knew that that I knew they need food. So I bait them in with food there. And they know. This is a, a, a redneck phalarope. rope. Um, you may know, <clears throat> I don't know if you've seen them in breeding plumage or not, but this is up in uh, uh, up in Alaska. And there were a hundred of these things around this pool here, and they were feeding on these midges that were on the 
surface. But I knew these midges were going to take off and fly. A midge is a little fly that hatches underwater, and then they come up, and they spend all the time on the surface, and then they fly off, and they got about 24 hours to live, and then they, you know, they breed, and they lay eggs and die. And they, but anyway, so these, there was, but I knew those midges were going to fly, and I didn't want a shot of that of that of those fader up feeding off the water i wanted the shot where they jump up in the air so notice my camera angle again i'm laying in cold mud it's 40 degrees guys it's cold by the way this is one of the sickest i've ever been i laid i laid three days in, in an anchorage alaska hotel room at 250 dollars a night recuperating because i was too sick to get on the airplane from from doing this shot but I knew that bird would, that, that midge would fly, they would eventually take flight and the bird would jump up and get them. So you got to know what you're doing here. So know your subject, know, know what's going on. And, and that is the number one thing to know about bird photography. Number two, in bird photography, in fact, I can't think of a, photo, a, a, a maybe photojournalism, maybe. But in bird photography, absolutely, the eyes must be tack sharp. No exceptions. The rest of that bird can be blurry, but the eyes have to be tack sharp. So when you're focusing here, you've got to understand your camera's focusing system. You've got to be able to put that, that focusing dot. Most cameras, pro cameras here, they've got a range of 40 to sometimes 160 little dots that, that focus on, you've got to be able to manipulate that dot with some kind of a joystick on those eyes. And with the Z9, I can get a lot of it done automatically now, unless it's something dark, but you, you, you got to have the focus point on the eyes of that bird, period. Don't do it. Do it. Even when you've got fast action happen, if you can't get the eyes tack sharp on that bird, you've wasted the digits. Now, I could probably get away with the quail in this shot having a, not blurry, but maybe not as tack sharp, but the, the eyes of that Cooper's hawk have to be tack sharp on that, on that stuff. That's, that's bird photography. Okay. Number three, head angle of the bird is critical. Now, this Pileated Woodpecker, for most folks, we think this is a pretty good shot. An editor would throw this back in my face. Look at the difference in head angle on this and the difference the way that photograph speaks to you when that head, that head, that head has to be turned in toward you about two to three degrees from the, from the, what do you call that? 180 degree mark, whatever you call that. I'm, you need, but, but he's been turning two to three degrees toward you on that. So head angle is critical on this thing. Here's another one. This is an American crow down here. Now, obviously this is this shot, the head angle is bad. Some of us would probably accept that here. Maybe this is a little bit better here as we go into it, but that head angle is too flat to me. Notice when I do this, I bring it in and how much more alive that photograph becomes just by the, the bird turning its head to me like that. Critical, you have that head angle there. You can see which, which, which shot that I put the most work in processing on, right? <laughs> so, but I wouldn't waste my time on that left-hand shot. It's not going to work, but bring it in on that. Okay. Fourth thing. Whatever photography you do, be it your dog, cat, kids, rattlesnakes, I don't care what you're doing. Your, you need to get down to that subject's eye level. Photographing something from above that level or shooting up at it, you're, 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 you're putting the viewer in the human perspective. They see that all the time, and they yawn with boredom. When you put that camera down low, like I've got here, and get in there, you're entering the world of that animal and you're bringing people in with you. This is what I do to get those shots. Now that hawk is over there at the end of that sand line. He's mantled on that, on that uh, kill. And really you can get pretty close to those hawks when they're doing that. Just, you know, <laughs> so, but you're mantled in on it and you can see how I'm dressed here. And if, for a better shot here, look on the left. This is how I dress when I'm out in the field. I even blacken my face up. 
So I go into McDonald's to get a, to, to get some sausage and biscuits, and I forget to clean my eyes off there from all the black on it. I had no idea why the why that cashier looked at me with you know with wide open horror when she saw my eyes all blacked up like that. And my buddy says, "Hey, let me take your picture here." And I had no idea what was going on. I was clueless until he showed me the picture here on that. But anyway, when I'm down there photographing hawks, I got to be careful of any kind of reflection. Even when the hawk's in close there, I can't blink my eyes. I got to close my eyes and look through, you know, look, barely them open, keep them, but they'll see your, the hawks will see your eyes moving. But you need to get down to whatever subject's eye level you're at. And that goes, again, not just for bird photography, but your, your photographs will take on a whole new level of interest. If you get if you if you get down and photograph at your kids or your grandkids or your pets or your snakes, I love they will. These are these are uh, these are gambles quail. Now, this bird's about six inches, maybe eight inches tall. Now the rooster, the, the 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 chicks are born. They're very precocious when they're born. In other words, as soon as they're born, they're up moving around here. And the hen takes some of them and the rooster takes some of them. And I love, I love, love, love photographing in the desert because if I can ever find a water hole, I don't have to go any further. I know, know that wildlife is going to come to me. And usually it's going to be about sunup. So I get, now, now this bird's about six inches high. Look at my camera angle. I'm down low. I'm shooting up at this bird. Where do you think I'm at? I'm in the water. I, I wade into this water. It's cold, hard, dark. You get the recurring theme here? Cold, hard, dark. I get in this water, and I got to sit in this water. And, and, and the desert, for as hot as it gets in the daytime, it gets cold as anything at night. But I can't make any waves because I can't have my waves in the picture, my, my, my waves in the picture going toward the bird. So I have to sit there in this water. Camera, I've got $40,000 worth of camera gear staged millimeters above this water. Now think about your laptop computer out there. It's the same thing. If water gets into it, they're not waterproof, folks. I've done wasted too many cameras and lenses from dropping them in water because there's no repair for that. You just throw it away and go get you another one. I've got $40,000 worth of camera gear laying there on just a millimeter above the water here waiting for these quail to come in or waiting for something to come in and these quail come in and, 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 and I photograph. Now, I gladly got out of the water in a hurry as soon as this photograph is taken. Again, notice here my camera angle. I'm low. I'm, the way I get these eagle shots is I go up to Homer, Alaska, and and I hire a boat, I buy fish, and I hire young men to go out with me. And I get in the water and they throw fish out over my head and the eagles come in to get those fish. That's how I get these shots here. There I am in the water photographing these eagles. That's what I'm doing here. That water, that water there is about 40 degrees. I can't stay in the water about 15 or 20 minutes because I lose feeling in my legs and, and I'll fall down. So that's 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 I'm limited on that, but that's what we're doing out there in Latin to get there. So it's not only getting down low, but whatever your subject line level is, get 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 high. I was <laughs> this was in Peru. And, and they wanted me to go out there and photograph these Andy and Cock of the Rock. There, there was a lek down there. And so to do this, they, the, 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 they started early building a scaffolding. This shot is 80 feet up in the air. I'm 80. Now, now that may not sound much sitting here on the ground. But remember, they, build this, they, they start early building the scaffolding a little bit at the time so they don't spook these birds. And over that time, all kind of moss and slime grows on that scaffolding that you've got to climb up. And I'm climbing up there with 40 or 50 pounds of camera gear. And guess when I start climbing? 
It's cold, hard, dark. And I got to be in that up there in that scaffolding, 80 feet up in the canopy to photograph these birds as they're displaying. So get eye level. Photographing this from the ground would, would all out again with a big red belly would outline my black. It wouldn't have worked. We had to get high to do it. Another rule, watch your background. The difference between an amateur and a professional is the background. You, you need to understand something called aperture on your camera. It's f-stops. And, and, and what that is, is the hole that, that, that you let light in to hit, to hit the sensor on your camera here. It's a hole. And the bigger that hole, in other words, the lower the f dot, that lower the f number, the shallower your depth of field is. Depth of field is any two points that are in acceptably sharp focus in that photograph. And so, when you're shooting with a big wide open aperture, you're going to blur out a whole lot of stuff. If you're shooting with a with a with a with a, a stop down aperture, say f11, f16, you're going to have a whole lot of stuff in focus. So, you got to watch your backgrounds. You want nice, clean backgrounds on these things, on these shots here. When you do it, okay. For example, you're seeing these backgrounds, okay. And if you can't find the acceptable background, you make your own background. This is how we do these hummingbird shots here. We do these hummingbird shots with multi-flash setups here. Uh, we, you can see that it's raining. The reason there's plastic bags over our flashes here, but we have uh, four to five flashes set up around a feeder, and if the flashes don't fire, the flame will, the, the frame will be totally black. But those those flashes fire so fast they give us an, they give us an effective shutter speed of about twenty five thousandths of a second, which freezes the wings on these hummingbirds here. But notice that the backgrounds on these hummingbird shots are just a piece of cardboard. We make our we make our own background, but uh, I couldn't get a clean background otherwise. How do I get them to come in? Well, I got a feeder right there, and I what I'll do is I'll switch that feeder off with a flower, and I'll I'll use a syringe, and I'll put sugar water in those plants to get them to come into that. And that's good for about two or three dips. Then I got to, then I got to get rid of the flower and let them go back to the feeder again. But that's the way we're doing these shots for for these these high speed flash shots for hummingbirds. That's the way they're done. Again, I hope I'm not disillusioning anybody, but this is the way wildlife photography is done, guys. Incidentally, I'm sitting there photographing these these uh, booted racket tails down here, right here in this place here, and, and this this uh, toucanet shows up there, and I thought, man, that is neat. The next thing I know. That guy grabs one of my hummingbirds and eats it. Swallows it down, feathers going out, and, I, and I'm stunned. And while I'm stunned there, he grabs a second one and eats a second one right there. So these, these guys are the bad boys of, of, of the bird world down there. So <laughs> this is rule number six. You got to know the shot you want. I think it's rule number seven, really. I think it, I think so. Uh, anyway, you got to know the shot you want. You never let the camera think for you. You've got to you've got to be in charge of your camera. Go back to reading that owner's manual. So this is the most difficult photograph I've ever done. Uh, <clears throat> this shot here. This is what it looks like. This is my back. This is my backyard. I built this pond. I put the rocks in it. I put the plants there. And I put cat food around those rocks to draw that raccoon in. Now, the hard part, this was just work. That's easy done. But the hard part was, is I had to put flashes. I had to imagine what would happen, how the flashes would look at night. And I had four flashes set up to illuminate that raccoon as he came in there and to get the proper thing. So I had to visualize that was totally, I, I built this and put it up in the daytime and I had to visualize what was going to happen at night. You got to be able to do that. That was step number six. And here's a repeat number six. This is really number seven. 
know the difference between a field guide photo photography and art? Now, by that, I mean, it's wonderful to go there and grab a picture that shows the bird in all the details. But if you're going to create art, you need to be able to tell a story in that photograph. These are Nazca boobies down in the Galapagos. And, and you know, they lift, they, nesting down there, there's not, there's not a lot of nesting material. So, you know, they lay an egg pretty much on bare rock. And part of their pair bonding is, the female is the lower one there and the male there, she's sitting on a nest. The male brings her, you know, pieces of nesting material. So here he is, he's bringing her a rock. Now, this was one of the most cutest things I've ever seen in wildlife photography. She doesn't just reach up there and grab that rock from that male. She admires that rock. She looks at it from this direction and then she turns her head around and she looks at it from another direction and she just looks at it from all angles. And ever so gently, she reaches up there and grabs that rock. And then she looks all around her nest for just the right place to put that rock. She puts it down and you can literally see the pride on that old boy's face, man. He looks at what he goes find him another rock. You can't help it. You can't help him but feel that in that. This is a uh, I'm sorry, I just dropped sink on this thing. I'll think about it in just a second, but there's probably not 12 pictures of this bird in the world. And the, the problem is not that this bird is super rare. It's not, it's very common, but these are the South American mice. They stay in heavy, heavy cover all the time. You might help me out on this bird. I just, I just dropped sink on it. I'm sorry. If you got to help me out in the chat, I'd appreciate it. Call it out for me. So, um, they stay on the thing. So I heard about a farmer that had one of these birds trained to come to his call. And I told the 20, 23 year old snot nose, I told him about this. And he told me, he said, Dean, he said, we, we, we have that all the time here. He said, it never pans out. I said, well, I'm going to go find out about this thing. So I go, I go and I find the old boy that, 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 that the farmer that's supposed to have this, this you know, magic intellect over this bird here, ant Peter, uh, 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 crimson, uh, it's a crimson necked ant Peter. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Thank you. Crimson necked ant Peter. And so I find the old boy that's got that, that, that the can't, and he doesn't speak English. I don't speak Spanish, but, but, you know, I find that language is really no barrier to communication. I pull out my, 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 my field guide and I show him what I want. And he says, see, see, see. So he most me to go with him. And, you know, we go off in the jungle. He's got a machete. I've got $40,000 worth of camera gear. Nobody knows where I'm at, but anyway, off we go. And directly we come to this little clearing and he motions me to sit down at one end of it. And he goes up there and he makes three little whistles, literally just like that. And the lamp Peter comes hops up on a log and he puts mealworms out there for him to eat. So that was the star of the show when I got that. So then. Also, you know, the, 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 the bird doesn't have to be the major part of the photograph to tell the story. Now, these little hummingbirds are just insignificant in this big landscape here. But they're absolutely necessary for the photograph. Just take your thumb and put over that those hummingbirds and see how boring that shot is. You need that likeness, but just tell them the story where they live and, and in the cloud forest of Ecuador on that. All right, folks, I think my time is close here. Hey, look, I do this because I love it. And I am very fortunate to be able to do this thing. I mean, literally, uh, there's no way that what I get paid compensate for the time and equipment and et cetera that I've got. But luckily, I mean, I would not have any other way. And I feel like I'm one of the most lucky men in the world. And so why do I do this thing? Well, John, John James Audubon captured it the best. 
Awareness is the first stage of conservation. You know, we as a dominant species on this planet, I'm preaching to the choir here, we are, we are causing an extinction rate greater than when the dinosaurs left. And it's because people are ignorant of what's out there. So if I can show these pictures, I can give these talks just to make them aware of what we're losing. At least they're doing something with a purpose in. So thank you all very much for your attention. And uh, let me entertain any questions about the travels, the photography, or whatever I can answer. So please, if you got any, I see, some th I see a couple of chats here that are to me. What have I got here? Uh, you want me to do these for Dean, thank you so much. You uh, kept your promise. You said you were going to be entertaining, and you certainly were. Um, so one of the, uh, the first question here is from John Anderson. It says, Dean, thanks. Your talk was both amazingly entertaining and informative, although I'm having a hard time forgiving you for stealing the dog's bed. And I am shocked, shocked <laughs> at your staging of the Kingfisher photo. But in my experience, so many bird shots are fleeting. It's a quick moment. If you aren't ready, you're dead. So if you were in the field looking for an opportunistic shot, not sitting in a pit waiting for a picture, what settings do you keep your camera on? And also in that situation, what kind of lens do you recommend? A 500 millimeter seems a bit big. Maybe a zoom of some sort. Thanks for your talk. Okay, let's answer the same. Any zoom that reaches to 500 is okay. Anything less than that, anything less than that, you're outgunned, folks. I mean, birds are too small. You need something that you can put a 1.4 telex extender on to reach you out there, 500 to give you out there to whatever 1.4 times 600 something. But it'll get you out there where you can reach it. And, you know, even with these, it, it, especially things we got here, like tiny warblers and things, I'm within 30 feet just to get frame filling images of these birds with a 600 with a 1.4 on it, 1.4 tele extender multiplier on there. So any zoom lens that will work that, 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 that what you could put a, you could put a tele extender on and feel comfortable with it. Some of the, the high priced uh, zooms work okay with the tele extender. Some of the third party ones, not so well. If you want to ask me the lens, I recommend Canon, Nikon, Sony. I mean, they're the big guys. They're expensive. Uh, they're the big guys. Now, I know a pro that shoots Tamron and does a great job at it. He makes a lot of money at it. So, you know, you let your conscience and your budget be your guide. And, and, you know, but again, let me tell you this. I'm shooting from position of a guy feeding editor's photograph. If you're doing this, <laughs> it's like other things. Who am I going to satisfy? Me. Okay. If you're doing it for that, you know, be, be, be your, you know, you know, the biggest, I, I'm, I'm going to get to the second part of your question, but now you got me on my soapbox. The, the, the biggest, biggest jump in my photography, the thing that really got me over the top was when I quit caring what other people thought about my work. I mean, we all say that. But we all love those Facebook things when we post them. Oh, great photo. We all suck that up. But no, when you really, 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 really get to the stage that I like this photograph and I just don't give a damn what you think about it. You know, there, there are photographs in my portfolio that my editors just scream over, but I love them. And I photo I show them and I I meant to put one up here and I, I didn't do it. But you know, one of the the bad things you ever do is have two birds overlapping in a photograph. Well, I've got one. I love a wood duck doing that and things, but so whatever makes you happy, do it. Okay. Now, uh, what setting would I had if I'm going to do a grab shot? Well, it, I'm going to take in position, probably one of my rules that I should have put up there. And I, and now that I'm thinking about it, it needs to be a big rule, probably right after number Two, the sharp eyes is that bird photographs always have to be done. I mean, uh, that's not always, but it's very difficult to make a boat bird photograph unless your shadow is pointing directly at the bird. Very difficult to make a, a great bird photo unless you're shooting 
flat light on the bird. Now, mammals are totally different. People are totally different. But birds need that. You, 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 you ought to have the sun right at your back photographing that bird. And, and your shadow ought to be dead on that bird. More than two or three degrees off, it's going to mess up. So what I'm going to do, if I'm out in the field, I'm going to find something that is a neutral color. Maybe I'll use the palm of my hand and I'm going to make an exposure. Now, uh, my minimum, my minimum shutter speed for birds, even if they're standing still, is one two fifty of a second. If I'm expecting them to move, I'm going to get a whole lot faster than that. Flight photography, I'm doing one four thousand of a second. Okay, that's that. that but then I set that up, and then I start setting my my aperture and my ISO to meet those parameters. As long as the light is behind my back and is staying steady, which it won't, you're going to have to keep doing that all through the day if you're doing grab shooting like that. I do very very little grab shooting, very little of it. It's just it's too unpredictable, and of course. Uh, I can I find I can get a lot better shot by making the birds come to me rather than me going to the birds. Did that help? Did I answer a question? I think it does. And there's another question here. Where are your favorite places to photo birds in, in the Maryland area? <gasps> hmm. Well. Anytime you get on public land and you break out a long lens, you meet a lot of your best friends. What you doing here? What you got? Well, and then, and then you got a big crowd up around you. It's hard to photograph there. So anywhere I can find private land to photograph on, that's what I want to. It, 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 I, I don't mind. I don't mind giving photo talks. And I, you know, I, I love doing this and I love teaching people about photography. But when I'm out in the field, and and I break out that long lens. It's just it, it attracts a crowd, and you're on public land. So, if I was gonna, it would depend on the year. I, I, anywhere I can find um, a funnel point, like Point Lookout in the fall, is a great one right here in Southern Maryland. I love Point Lookout in the fall. Uh, it's just uh, because it it's a big funnel point that goes down there for for the migration. Uh, it's also, you know, it, it can be good in the spring if you get the right conditions coming in. Uh, I'm going to look for, uh, uh, it's not like the location I'm looking for. It's going to be the conditions that I'm in uh, that I can find out and the species that I want. Uh, the places I like to photograph are the same places you like to bird, if I can do it. I mean, the same places you want to bird at. That would be the place to do it. Um, so, uh, picking a spot here, uh, you know, Conowingo Dam is good for eagles, but you know, you're going to wind up with a whole bunch of friends there. I mean, it's just crowd as it can be now. The word's out on that. Um, anywhere, usually wildlife management areas in the spring are very good because nobody's on them, hunting them, and, and people aren't, people aren't going there, not unlike a state park because there's no bathrooms and all that stuff there to see. So I would look at any wildlife management areas close to you like that. Uh, you, I, I'm going to tell you that I don't have a lot of great opportunities in Maryland, to be honest with you, unless I'm doing something like a pelagic bird or something like that. Um, I don't mean to speak disparaging of my home state here, but uh, here they just, I just don't have a lot, but I'm, but if I'm going out, I'm going to get out in the wildlife management areas and that kind of stuff. And in the spring, you know, when you got migration going through, you can do pretty good if you get into those places and know the habitats of the birds you want to be. I'm not giving you a specific place because I don't have one. I'm just looking because there's so many and it depends upon the time of year, the species I want, uh, the weather is a big deal on that too. Okay. So I think I, I, I think I'm copping out on that, but I, I, I don't know a better way to answer the question. Yep. So, and we have a question from Finn, who's head of our youth birding group. He says, my camera budget is already shot and can really only afford one or the other, tripod versus monopod. Literally, every picture I take is on a tripod. Literally. I do not, I, I, I do not handhold. 
I mean, I know that that one over the the, the, the rule is one over the focal length and shutter speed. You know, I, I you do that, and we start pixel peeping. I'll promise you that my tripod shots will, we, there'll be a noticeable difference in our in our shots with me on a tripod, you hand holding, or you with a monopod. Uh, you start trying to hold a five hundred on a monopod. Now, let me revise that, saying that this new Z nine has got some internal uh vibration reduction in the camera body that seems to be amazing to me um so maybe with a high-end pro body you might get away with a monopod but uh, in my mind a, a, a good tripod and by the way the tripod doesn't need to have a center post the tripod doesn't need a center post it needs to be uh three legs and a tripod head not some post that you run up and down because then you've just got a monopod with three legs on it. So yeah, tripod hands down. And I have a question for you, Dean, on that raccoon shot, because you yeah. mentioned that there were, you used four flashes. Um, mm -hmm. That didn't scare him off. By the time it scared him off, I had, I, I had the shot, but you know, no, they, that doesn't, it, they'll, it, Animals, even even hummingbirds and stuff, the first one they'll look up at it, but then they get used to it and it doesn't bother them. Once they, it, it, as long as you don't move or react, no, it didn't scare him. But he, he was too interested in the cat food. Yeah. So we have we have one other uh, camera question here. Hmm. It, it say, uh, and uh, it's kind of responding to one of your early answers. It said, "So your priority is shutter speed?" Question. I don't want to oversimplify this, but should I be setting my speed fast and let my camera choose the f-stop? <laughs> <laughs> Your camera doesn't choose anything. <laughs> Your camera doesn't choose it. You choose what you're doing. You, you, you choose what you're doing. Set your shutter speed. Learn to use manual. Learn, learn, learn what, you know, and, and digital photography is free after you buy the camera and go broke buying all that stuff. Yeah. But okay. But learn to look at a scene and know just by looking at it, know what the exposure is going to be. You can do that real easy just by taking your camera out in your backyard and just walking around. So that, that ought to be, you know, this shutter speed, this, this aperture, this ISO click and look at the back of your camera. How'd you do? And adjust from that. No, I, I, no, 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 no. You don't let the camera decide anything, folks. Don't do it. Otherwise, otherwise, it's not your photograph. It, it's this machine's photograph that just got made. So we have one question here that it must be somebody in the military yes. uh, that's used to acronyms that says, what does TAC stand for? T-A-C-K. TAC is, is not an acronym. TAC is, is, is an expression we use that is sharp enough to cut your finger on. That's got to be sharp. I mean, there can't be anything blurry about those eyes. They've got to be, you've got to be able to see every eyelash, every hair around that eye. That's what TAC sharp means. Not an acronym. Just, just it's an expression mean very, very, very sharp, no compromise. Well, Dean, this has been an amazing talk. You're getting lots of cute kudos in the chat. Thanks so much for spending all your time with us. Um, we could probably sit here and listen to you all night. Uh, but Molly, let me, Molly, one more thing. Let me just reiterate. Uh, I don't know if you got, but uh, if, if I can help you, let me know. Uh, let me give you a cell phone number you can reach me at. I don't mind doing that. 301 672 five, four, six, four. If I can help you to do that, I'm happy to do it. Uh, if, um, if you got a group that wants to talk, given on photography, Hey, I'm, I'd love to do it. I, I, I enjoy doing that. I don't need pay for that stuff. And, and, uh, we'll, you know, I, I, I don't do it for money or anything like that. And if it's reasonable, I just, I fund my own travel, even not. So, so, but the point is, 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 you know, if I can, make people aware of what's there and I, you got a a, a, a a senior group or a church group or a boy scout group or something like that wants to talk hey let me do it okay so i'm sorry molly for interrupting
No, no, that's that's quite all right. And we have one request. If you could just repeat that phone number one more time. 301-672-5464. Great. Thanks again so much. And thanks, everybody, for joining us. Um, as I said, you can check our archives. We have uh, some uh, great videos recorded there. And this one, if you want to tell all your friends about it, will be up on our website within the next few days. And we're getting tons of thank yous from everybody, Dean. Thank you so, so much for doing this. My pleasure. I, I love doing it. I love doing it.